Welcome everyone. I think we'll continue to have some folks joining us. Um, my name is Kathleen Secchi. I'm with the Family Focus Resource Center, and we're really glad that you could join us today for this very informative uh, workshop on CalABLE. So today we have uh, David Turk presenting. Um, <laughs> so uh, he's going to introduce himself in just a moment. I wanted to let everyone know uh, that if you'd, um, we'd like you to keep your um, keep your mute on so that we can uh, keep any background noise down. And all questions will be taken at the end. Um, if you do have questions, um, you can either put them in the chat um, or raise your hands. Um, the chat seems to work the best, just to let you know. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to David. And um, just one more thing, I need to double check. Um, okay. So I'll go ahead and hand that over to you, David, and thank you so much for being here. Fabulous. Thank you for having me again, Kathleen. Uh, well, welcome. I see a number of familiar names and faces. And if you are able to show your face, I always love to see a smile or two. It's been a while. Um, so my name is David Turk. I am the executive director of Serenitas Special Needs Planning. Um, we have over 30 years of experience focusing exclusively on families living with special needs and uh, addressing four areas of life that affect the person living with special needs. That is uh, legal planning, government benefit coordination, budget and financial planning, and lifestyle planning, all of which all affect your loved one in some way or another. So all of those things go together. Today, we're gonna to focus on the Cal ABLE program, its benefits, how we, what its roles are, what its terms are, um, how we use it to our best benefit. An ABLE account is a tool. It's a tool to solve a problem. We call this a problem. It's a good problem. It's money. It's money that we have, but we need to protect the benefits of our loved one. And we know, we've heard out there somewhere that if we have over $2,000 in assets, we're unable to maintain SSI benefits. An ABLE account is a wonderful development. Um, and let's get into exactly what that is. We're gonna define the program and then we'll get into a little bit of how ideas of how best to utilize this for your family. Okay, so uh, today we are gonna talk about protecting assets, saving money, and protecting your benefits. A little background, uh, I can't believe it's already been, wow, since 2014, but um, ABLE, A-B-L-E, stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. This was passed in the federal government level in 2014. Interestingly, it was uh, unanimous and bipartisan in a rare accord. Um, for those of you that might be familiar with college savings programs, the 529 College Savings Program, uh, ABLE is written under the exact same tax code. It is under 529A. Um, what that means is uh, if you are familiar with that program, it treats, it, it treats things, uh, it, it treats money in the exact same way. So deposits are after tax dollars. They, when they go in, they are tax advantage in their growth. And when used for qualified disability expenses, which we will define later, um, they come out tax free. This was developed really with the recognition that government benefits are not going to provide everything. While in, an incredibly important component, they are not going to provide everything that your loved one needs uh, to, in order to provide that quality of life that you would expect them to have. An ABLE account allows you to put cash into this account up to $15,000 per year and have it considered a non-countable asset by SSI and Medi-Cal. So what that means is you are able to save up to $15,000 in this account per year without it affecting SSI benefits. So you can have supplemental funds 
and still continue to receive uh, the government benefits that your loved one's eligible for. Who is eligible? The disability has to have occurred or been diagnosed, uh, excuse me, not occurred, but um, presented, excuse me, before age 26. And you have to meet the criteria for the disability defined under SSI. There is also a self-certification method where you certify that I have a disability. Um, you have the documentation to support that even so that what that means is you can self-certify and not be receiving SSI benefits and still have an ABLE account. Um, again, the diagnosis has to be determined to last more than a year, which typically with, with our population, this is not an issue. The uh, qualifying conditions are listed in, on social security. And recently there has been an expanded uh, list of eligible criteria, eligible diagnoses. Um, all that can be found on SSA or the Cal ABLE website. And we'll go through all of that. Okay, so historically before ABLE accounts were passed into law. If a loved one had more than $2,000 in their name, they had very few options. They either would have interrupted benefits or they would have to spend down the money, which spending money isn't necessarily a bad thing, but at some point, spending upon spending becomes frivolous. And there's certainly better ways to use that money by saving um, for what we know we will need in the future. The only other option, if a loved one had received, let's say an inheritance, um, there was a different type of special needs trust that would accommodate this, but those were your only two options. It was spend it or create a disability trust. Uh, at least that's what it's called in California. Now with an ABLE account, that solves an awful lot of problems. Very frequently families receive their SSI check and they may not use all of it. Well, rather than accruing money in a bank account, which is going to impact your SSI benefits, they can simply, those, those funds can simply be deposited into an ABLE account and be protected without any of the fuss of frivolous spending or creating a reactionary trust. And I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit later. So now with the development of an ABLE account, you can save up to $15,000 a year. And the total amount can, be, can grow to up to $100,000 without it affecting SSI benefits. So that kind of begs the question, well, what if I'm not on SSI and I'm on SSA, which is a survivor retirement benefit of my parents? Well, then that $100,000 threshold does not you're not impacted by that threshold. And Medi-Cal is not affected until a much higher uh, number. I believe it's $529,000 now. Oh, is that on this sheet? I can only see half of this. There we go. 529,000 total contribution cap. So moving on, what can I use? funds for? What is a qualified disability expense? What is allowed and what isn't allowed? Um, this happened to be a, a question that was asked before, uh, you know, prior to the workshop. And I thought that was really a great question. So let's get into it. Any expense related to the designated beneficiary, your loved one, as a result of living a life with disabilities, that helps maintain or improve your health independence or quality of life. Gee, almost anything can be, you can define almost anything that way. Um, the categories are intentionally broad and include education, housing, transportation, healthcare expenses, community supports, so many things. So let me get to what, what it doesn't cover. And I really, I because they're so broad and the categories are so broad and you are meant to be able to use this for just about anything in your life, what wouldn't qualify? Um, 
I was thinking that gambling would probably not be an appropriate use of funds. The IRS might frown upon that. Um, loaning money from ABLE account funds might be frowned upon um, or investing in other securities might not be approved by the IRS. It isn't really super clear. Uh, there is a penalty if you do not use funds for appropriate uses. Uh, it is not the ABLE accounts or the Cal ABLE that's going to do that, but it's going to be the IRS and that happens through an audit. Um, so I'm not here to provide tax advice. I have not seen anyone that the accounts are relatively new, even though it's 2014, California's has been in effect since 2018. I don't think the danger is great, but we do want to do things the right way. Um, so keep that in mind and use things, use your common sense. And if there's a question, call me, look it up on the ABLE account site. Uh, actually, Cal ABLE has a wonderful 800 line and they're more than happy to help you walk through any of those questions as well. Um, so if you have a question, do find out and don't put yourself in a position of, of running into some sort of penalty. All righty. There is some proposed federal legislation. Um, one of the issues that we run into in special needs planning and in, in, our, in our world is what happens if we're over 26 when we are diagnosed with something? What if there's a traumatic brain injury when we're 30? Um, certainly that person should be able to receive government benefits, but, that, but the rules do not allow that. A person can have an will, excuse me, there's proposed legislation to increase the age of, an, of being able to have a, uh, an ABLE account from the disability onset of age 26 to 46. Now this has been sitting in Congress for a number of years now. Um, my belief is it's just a matter of it coming up on the docket before that gets passed, this uh, non-controversial seemingly issue. Um, but it has been a few years and that is not yet. So currently the age still is at age 26. Let me go back before I, you can read this IRS regulation stuff, but, oh, what was I, had a thought there and it escaped me. All right, it'll come back. Regulations. So often it has been asked who can open an account for a for a beneficiary and i looked up what alr was and i thought i memorized it and i forgot but it's a it's another person who can make decisions for you so it can be a person with the power of attorney the guardian or conservator a spouse a parent a sibling grandparent the rep payee, that's new. That was really unclear for a number of years. And that's, we've received clarification on that or the person of the beneficiaries choosing. Uh, that's asterisk. And we would want to make sure that that is an accurate, uh, that the person that's chosen is, is appropriate. Okay. This is a reasonable time to actually stop for any questions. And then I will pop into how do we use able accounts in for our family right uh, uh, an account is wonderful but how do we m best use it for the different situations that our families will see so um let me open it up to some questions now i think i've covered ev all of the questions that were asked ahead of time did we okay. come up with any new ones again you can uh put that in the chat or you can raise your hand All right, I am super clear today. I love when that happens. Um, ask questions as you need, please pop up. So very, very frequently families will ask, well, does this, does an ABLE account replace a special needs trust? What do I need? Um, the answer is it does not replace it. They work together. Uh, these are tools that may or may not be appropriate for you. Um, an a I, 
don't see any reason why any family shouldn't have an ABLE account. It, it makes perfect sense. They are inexpensive. There's a, a minor nominal fee to open it up. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to have an ABLE account just as a relief valve. So the situation that I described before where your loved one is receiving too much money. This is a good problem, but we don't want to go over $2,000 in a month period because uh, it will interrupt our SSI and or Medi-Cal benefits. So simply having an ABLE account open and you notice that the accounts go, oh, we're at $2,200, just hit the relief valve button, deposit two or $300 into the ABLE account. And then you don't have to worry about any of the issues with social security. So I knew if I talked long enough, I would remember the point that I forgot earlier. Funds can be used for housing with an asterisk. You must do it properly. And the way to do it is you, those funds that are spent on housing must be withdrawn and spent in the same calendar month. Not 30 day period, but calendar month. So simple example, rent is due on the fifth. I take money out on the second and pay rent on the fifth, two thumbs up. I take money out on the 31st of the previous month and pay rent on the fifth. That's two calendar months. And that may trigger uh, a red flag from, S from SSI saying you had too much money in that account in that month. And really it is just about a social security accounting function and that's the way it has to be for them. So you can use it for housing, just make sure it's used in the same month. Excellent, okay. Back to special needs trusts. So a special needs trust is yet another tool to allow exempt assets to reside. So what does this mean? Um, again, an ABLE account is a tool where the person receiving money can put their assets in, the first person, and put them into the ABLE account. Um, but there are limitations to ABLE accounts. And one of them is that you can only put up to $15,000 a year. You have $100,000 max if you're receiving SSI and it can only hold cash. So what happens if mom, mom and dad pass away and they leave their house? Where does that go so that it can safely be passed and not impact government benefits? And that's where a special needs trust would come in. This leads right into there are different types of special needs trusts for different situations. Um, there are first person trusts, which tend to be used reactively. You may remember I mentioned that before. So a reactive trust is one that we create when we're reacting to a situation. We're reacting to the good problem of a child receiving an inheritance. That money is technically theirs, and if they had received Medi-Cal treatment over the years, Medi-Cal would have a right at to come back and ask for payback. So a first party trust allows the individual to be able to preserve those funds for their benefit while they're living. And when they pass away, if there's anything in that trust, then Medi-Cal would have an opportunity to recover past funds uh, be reimbursed for past services rendered, and then the remainder can go to any beneficiary named. Um, that's, that's actually why it's a reactive trust, because if we're planning ahead of time, ideally we would want to preserve funds for the family rather than paying back to the government. And there are ways to handle that. They're just, again, different tools for different situations. When you utilize a third party special needs trust, that's being proactive. And that allows anyone in the world to be able to fund that trust, except the beneficiary, the person living with special needs. Whoever is receiving the benefits of that trust cannot put their own money in. And I make this distinction 
Well, because it's a distinction with a big difference. You do not want to commingle funds, okay? So we can have a special needs trust and an ABLE account together and they both serve different purposes. So let's take a situation where a child receives an inheritance of $10,000 and has a special needs trust. Well, if the $10,000 comes directly to the child, grandma and grandpa, there may be a special needs trust there, but they didn't know to leave the money to the trust and they left it to their grandchild. Okay, not ideal, but not the end of the world. That can be dealt with. So in this case, that's a small enough denomination where you're able to de simply deposit that in an ABLE account with no fuss whatsoever. There are other situations where we have bigger, better problems and hey, more money, more problems, right? We'll be happy to accept those problems. Um, if you, there are other ways to move money from one's ownership to another. So for instance, so a, a lot of the problem is that, again, our loved ones we're trying to manage their finances so that they don't lose benefits. So you just, you need to be a little bit careful about it and keep records. Um, let's say that one has $50,000 in, let's say $30,000 in uh, money coming to them. Well, if they're living at home with mom and dad, mom and dad have most likely had an awful lot of expenses that they paid out of pocket. And so one option can be to reimburse oneself from those funds and you can lower the amount. So let's say um, what you are able to do with uh, social security is you can write a letter that's called an expense reimbursement letter. And in this letter, you're able to say, my child has $30,000 and received it that here. And when I look back over, you, you're able to go backwards over 15, one, five, 15 months and identify reimbursable expenses that might draw that number down. And when that number gets drawn down, if you're able to justify those expenses, then that money's no longer theirs. It's yours. It won't impact their benefits and then you as mom and dad can recirculate those dollars to your loved one's benefit. Just a, a clever idea of how to utilize the tools that you have at hand um, that might not be as straightforward as you would hope. So if you have questions about the, those types of strategies and funding your child's future, that is certainly something that we can help with. Um, so let's move on. I think there's just another one or two pages. Other considerations, ABLE accounts, I mentioned, they accept cash only and only up to $15,000 a year. I remember the other thing. So if your child is working and they have an income, they can actually save an additional $12,060 a year in addition to that $15,000. So in a perfect world and your child is able to work and receive benefits and uh, you know, has $15,000 coming from another source, they can actually save up to $27,060 a year. That's a, all the stars are perfectly aligned and everything's great, but that is, that is potential. And that's a really big, um, it's a big opportunity for people and it allows loved ones to be able to achieve some greater independence. And I, as the program would indicate, achieving a better life experience, which is really all we're looking to do. A um, Couple other items about ABLE accounts. So ABLE accounts do, they, are, they were passed federally and most states have their own version. There are some states that uh, work collectively. There are some that work individually like California. Almost all of them allow out of state participation. Um, one of the reasons that, that I really, and, and I'm not here to, to promote one over the other, you, uh, you must do your own research and find what works for you. 
but what I do like about the California version and uh, the Pennsylvania version, there may be a couple other states, those are the two off the top of my head that I know of. Those two states, California and Pennsylvania, removed the Medi-Cal or Medicaid payback provision. It's really important. So what mo the federal legislation indicates is that the beneficiary is able to have this account, but just like the disability trust that I mentioned before, when the beneficiary passes away, then Medicaid has the right to come back and ask for funds uh, to be reimbursed for past services rendered. California and Pennsylvania remove that provision, which is really important as it relates to saving. Many families have more than one child and no one has infinite resources. So the more we can keep at the home, in the family, the better. Um, to not have to pay back money to social security that you've been paying in and saving for makes all the sense in the world. So this allows greater flexibility in savings and you don't have to worry as you would in other states about a potential payback if my loved one passes away and there's still money in there. Now I think I hit all the points. Um, we talked about all of this again, really important and i review this with all families this can be very complicated stuff because you're dealing with government and what are the rules and how do we stay on the correct side of the rules um first person versus third person not co-mingling that money with able accounts keeping a record or, or anything really a trust or an able account keeping records of what expenses have been what those funds have been used for. Really important. It's just going to save you an awful lot of potential hassle. Here's the deal. If you save everything, no one's ever going to look at it. If you don't, that's when you're going to, that's when that social security is going to call, right? You never heard of it. Oh, I don't need to save them. Just save the receipts, keep a record of what you're doing, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, I, as I mentioned before, the other options that existed before ABLE accounts were invented uh, was simply spending down or using a uh, first person trust. All right, so closing it out, the everyone is welcome to attend quarterly board meetings at uh, Cal Able. Let me give you a couple websites, which I didn't include on these. And uh, I think we'll probably include it in an email going out after. But one is the, uh, the National Resource Center for Able, and that's Able nrc.org. Again, that's able, A-B-L-E, nrc.org. And there they have a wonderful comparison function where you can compare different states across the board, different investment options, different fees, um, and make your own decision. Again, I really would encourage anyone looking at an ABLE account to make sure that you utilize one that does not have a payback provision. And being in California, that's uh, a reasonable option. So this is the list of board meetings. And finally, CalABLE staff, I believe we have a few Sandras here. Um, Dante Allen, Ann Osborne and Sandra Kent all provide their information. Um, yes, David, it's Kathleen with Family Focus again. Um, we are very um, pleased to have them joining us today. So we do have um, these folks with us today from Cal Able. And I wanted to jump in before we start with questions. Did you have one more thing to say, David? I'm sorry. No, uh, we're good. I just had my contact info and I am ready for questions. Well, just before we do questions, I did want to very um, quickly uh, do two very brief polls um, that will give us an idea of who's joining us today, and that is really great for us to know, and then um, I think that can be beneficial also for David. So I'm going to launch those polls, and the first one is um, how everybody is participating today. So here we go. You all should be able to see that on your screen. Okay. Right now, the largest percentage is looking like parents. That. 
and give that about 10 more seconds. Oh, and I did. I do see um, a mention from uh, in the chat. We have a, a foster parent also referred to as resource parent. Welcome. That's wonderful. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And I will share the results. So as you can see, we had 65% parents, we have professionals and other, and some under other may uh, share some additional details in uh, the chat. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just launch the second poll. Let's see, that is... Oops, sorry about that, I'm trying to... Uh... Getting that second poll launched for some reason. Hang on just a second. And there it is. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make that smaller. It's taking over the screen for some reason. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the second poll. Um, what area are you participating from today? I did notice that we have people far and wide throughout all of uh, the state of California, which is awesome, all the way up north to Sacramento, um, down to San Diego. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, there we go. Well, we've got a good mix here. So we'll see that about 15 seconds. Oh, Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> That's exciting. Welcome. Awesome. We've got a lot of people commenting in the uh, chat. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and one second, I think I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share that with you all. Okay, so there are the results. Yeah. Just the slightly largest amount is the Santa Clarita Valley, um, which is where I am coming from myself. Uh, but we also have the San Fernando Valley and um, no one was uh, from the Antelope Valley today, but we've got LA area and um, Northern Cal and other areas. So I'm gonna, that. let's see. Okay, so that should be cleared from the screen. And um, yeah, Riverside County, we, had lo we have lots of folks, like I said, far and wide. So um, we'll go ahead and have David uh, take questions. I think Victoria, we have some in the chat. Hi, yes, David, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, let's see, someone asked, um, okay. Uh, someone asked, what do you mean disability by before age 26? My son is 20, was diagnosed when he was three. And you're all set. And you're all set. Um, yes. The, the disability has to occur before the age of 26. So, so that doesn't mean often there's a question, does it need to be diagnosed? So uh, it does not need to be diagnosed. For instance, one might live with autism and not have been diagnosed until they were 30, but clearly that's not something that just appears. You've lived with it your entire life and that is um, eligible. So it's not, it's not diagnosed, it's onset. Big, big difference. You don't need the doctor's note to prove onset. Or, or at least a date on it. All right, thank you. Well, I'm gonna read another one. Lenora asks, do not mingle first and third person money. What does that mean? That means if, let's consider your child is the first person, they're receiving benefits. Um, they should not have more than $2,000 in their name. So we'll consider your child the first person. Um, third person is anyone else in the world. So the reason an ABLE account is wonderful is it allows your child to be able to save those funds directly um, without the need of creating a disability trust if it's a, a sum under $15,000. Did that, was that clear? I think so. 
Okay, and then uh, Phyllis asked a two-parter. So the first part, what happens if the account reaches $100,000? You, if you are on SSI benefits, your benefits will be suspended until the account goes under $100,000. Okay, and what was the amount that you can earn when someone is working? What additional you amount can be pause, You can save up to 12,060. Don't ask me why, how they come up with these numbers, um, but 12,060. One, two, zero, six, zero. Per year? Per year, if they are working, that's the income that they can save uh -huh. on top of the standard $15,000 um, allowance. Okay. All right, and then someone asked, can you refer us to somebody who can help us create a special needs trust? Wow, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, you, may, you may call me. Uh, this, all we do is special needs planning. We don't, that is, we, we help with conservatorship filing and creating comprehensive special needs plans, which will go into all of this, but whatever type of special needs trust that's appropriate, um, along with all of the attendant documents that all have to work properly together. Um, for instance, a will and a family trust and a special needs trust, they all, all work together. Um, so yes, we do all of that. We do financial planning and uh, lifestyle planning and uh, special needs planning all together because again, all of those elements are going to affect your child. You can't do one without the other or you don't have a plan that works. You need all of these elements, like a table. You need four legs on the table or it's tipping over. You have to support all those elements of life. Just having paperwork is not enough. And many families, you do need the proper paperwork, but it really is all the thinking that goes into what that paper says, those documents. What is the ultimate goal and have we thought through this? And that's where we're really able to walk through hand, hand in hand and discuss what your family is, what your, your particular situation is and what the best course of action might be for you. So uh, yes, please feel free to call and share. And also after this, um, Kathleen will be sending out an, an email with some follow-up information and some handouts as well. On there, there will be a book that you can download called The Beginner's Guide to Special Needs Planning, which, which we wrote. Um, download it, print it, because no one ever, is ever gonna read it online, but print it and put a binder clip on it and keep it around, I promise. It's gonna answer a lot of those questions that you have. I am always available. My goal is to help get you the answers that I know are so difficult to find. I know it's challenging that you have these questions, you may not know where to go, or if you have gone somewhere, you've gotten different answers everywhere you've asked. Um, please reach out if I can be helpful. Okay, a couple more questions, David. Um, Anne says, can you open use any bank to set up the ABLE account or does it need to go through a special bank? Great question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put only, the link in the chat. Perfect. It is only opened by the ABLE accounts, uh, the, the ABLE administration themselves. So you would go to calable.ca.gov. I should have put that up here. Um, actually, I think it's on the front page. I, I just put it in the chat. Perfect, perfect. So they are really very helpful there. You can either open an account online through the uh, through the website, or you can call them and have someone walk you through the steps of what needs to be done. Um, how are funds deposited? The best way, the easiest way is to set up an electronic deposit. Um, but you can also send a check. It's they're happy to accept money. Um, I would recommend setting up an electronic deposit account. It makes life so much easier. Um, so that relief valve that I was speaking of where, oh no, I'm at $2,200. 
You just go right to the computer, transfer some funds, and you're done. You don't have to worry about writing a check and waiting for it to arrive and having humans touch it. Uh, anytime you introduce the human element, there's more opportunity for error. And I, and I have had families who sent things in right at the end of the year and it didn't get in for the year. So that would be my recommendation. Great, thank you. One more question. Um, what happens with the money in the account if the beneficiary dies? Great question. So what I was alluding to before in all the other states except California and Pennsylvania and whichever one I'm missing, if there are funds left in the ABLE account, Medicaid has the right to come back and ask for past services rendered. If you haven't had services, there's nothing to pay back. Um, and then whatever is left in the account would be distributed to whomever you identified as being the beneficiary or the remainderman. So just like any other account, you can name someone to receive the assets when you aren't there. Um, same thing with this type of account. Also, I did have a, a pre-question, which was not directly related to ABLE, but someone had asked, oh, uh, Ms. Cruz, Oriana Cruz had asked, how to obtain rights for a child that will turn 18? And just real quickly to answer that, when your child turns 18, they are technically an adult, as I think your question is alluding to. Um, if you want to maintain your parental rights in California, you need to do a uh, conservatorship petition as a court procedure that where the court looks at your petition and indicates whether a conservatorship is appropriate. And uh, I, I can certainly elaborate on that if you'd like to, to speak outside of this. Okay, David, I have one more question from Cindy and she has her hand raised. Cindy, I'm gonna um, unmute you so that you can ask your question. Oh, wait a minute, where did I you I see go? Floor has a hand up too. Yeah, I think Floor just asked the question about what happens when the beneficiary, if the beneficiary dies. So, um, but if you have another question, Floor, or a different question, I love questions. I love questions. I think that was the question because now the hand is not raised. Very so good. I don't see any additional raised hands at this time. Um, so typically what happens is as soon as, as soon as we turn this off, that question that we forgot about comes up. Uh, please don't let it bother you write it down and feel free to contact me. I answer all questions. If I don't have the answer, we will find the answer. Okay, this is Kathleen again. Um, I think if we're going to conclude questions, um, I'll just go ahead and reiterate um, that David will uh, follow up with an email um, that I'll send on his behalf uh, for that um, planner's guide that you mentioned. And then um, we also are gonna have this recording that will be ready um, within a few days and that'll be at our website and our YouTube page and uh, in addition to the um, attachments. Um, and I'd love to, you know, really like to thank everybody for joining us and again, um, we really appreciate um, having the folks from CalABLE with us today, uh, Dante Allen and Osborne and Sandra Kent. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, especially a big thank you to David Kent, or uh, David Kent, I'm mixing people up now. <laughs> <laughs> We're all family. Um, David Turk um, for providing this workshop for us. And um, we'll, again, we'll follow up. And um, everybody have a wonderful evening and thank you again for spending this time with us.